Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God in his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. me to Luke tonight, chapter 5. Luke, chapter 5. If you'll turn there, as you're turning to Luke, chapter 5, I'm going to ask our ushers here and uh, ushers in Roanoke to just begin passing that sign-up sheet as it goes around. As you're turning to Luke 5, when it comes to you, let me explain what this sign-up sheet's all about. Uh, Billy Graham, wonderful, awesome evangelist, probably, the, uh, I would say the greatest evangelist, if not at least for sure one of, Reinhard Bonnke is right up there as well, but probably one of the greatest evangelists of our time, of our day, uh, had it put on his heart uh, by the Lord to start what he has done in other countries with what he has called my hope. In this case, My Hope America. Now, obviously, Billy Graham for years has done all kinds of crusades across America and around the world. But this My Hope is actually something that involves believers bringing people into their homes and sharing the gospel. It's what it's all about. What Matthew did, which we're going to read about Luke's account here in just a minute. But what I want to do is take a moment to explain to you that that sign-up card is for you to get to sign up to receive a free DVD that actually presents the video we showed this morning that you can get for free, postpaid, totally free to you to be able to use in as evangelism tool in this My Hope America that we're going to talk about tonight of how we can do this to be able to win souls and to help people know what we know and receive Jesus as their Savior. So if you'll sign that sign-up sheet for us, for those of you that would do so, what we're going to do, we're asking for your name and your email address. We're going to send you an email this week giving you a website to go to and a code to that you have to have to type in to be able to get that DVD absolutely free sent to your house. And on that DVD is the video we showed this morning of the national telecast that will be done here in our area. It'll happen on November the 8th. It'll happen at 6.30 on Channel 8, but then you'll have that same video, and you can show it any time in your home to share the, your faith with the other people. Now, on that DVD is also two other videos that are powerful as well, really good, uh, and even a Spanish version as well. So all that sign-up sheet is doing is you're saying, I want to do this. I want to be one of those to be a part of the My Hope America that Billy Graham is doing, and to get that DVD so I can invite people into my home and have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. I tell you what, man, if you saw the video this morning, they did awesome, as they always do, one awesome job anointed by the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, if you watch that and uh, you have any heart to know God, you're going you're gonna to surrender your heart to God. I'll guarantee you. What a blessing to have uh, Billy Graham, I believe in his 90s, 92, 93 years old, to be able to still present the gospel. Praise God. So I'm excited about this. It's a great part of what is now taking place all across America. Literally thousands upon thousands of Christians are picking up uh, this My Hope America and getting involved in it. Now, I want you to look at this little handout we gave you, and I'm going to show you a major statistic on this. To me, that is a key to understanding, obviously, why it's time Christians rose up and did what we're called to do, as we're going to talk about more about tonight. If you look at all these statistics, and none of them are, are good, obviously, we don't want anybody to be bound by any of this stuff. But in that bottom center box right there, this statistic just stands out to me. 60 out of 100 Americans, 60, think about that. Every 60 out of 100 Americans do not profess to be born again, have not acknowledged receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. I mean, I can't remember when it was. I think it was first of this year, end of last year, Barna did some statistics that they actually just simply asked people if they thought they were Christians. And I think 80% of us, 87% of Americans said, yeah, I'm a Christian. But how many know somebody could claim to be a Christian and never have received Jesus Christ? I know people that think because they went to church when they were a kid, they're a Christian. Uh, I, I know people today that think because they live in America, they think they're a Christian. I remember when I went to Romania to go and uh, I was there for uh, 10 days to go and, and uh, be a part of uh, Rufus Why Not, a guy that we support ministry there and preach for him. One of the things that Rufus told me you don't do in Romania, you don't walk up to anybody on the street and say, are you a Christian? Because everybody thinks they are. 
because of where they've been born in their aspect of their country of a Catholic faith. So I'm telling you, this is a staggering statistic. You think about that, 60 out of 100 have, have not professed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. How many know that if you just look around you, it's a dark day? And the Bible told us this would come. But I'm going to tell you what's great about it for me and you. Where the darkness creeps in, the light will shine even brighter. Uh, this is our opportunity to do what God's called us to do and gifted us and commissioned us to do as the body of Christ to be able to win souls and change people's lives. There is no greater experience in life than knowing that you're helping people to not only know Jesus, but to walk with him. In the service this morning, at the close of the service, I asked everybody at that time to close their eyes and to think back to the moment, the day, the time in which you got born again, and how much of an impact that had on your life, how different you felt, how incredible it was to experience the love of God and the presence of God in your life. I'm going to tell you, it's that aspect of God's love that we experienced in that moment that we're going to read about tonight that should be compelling us to become what, what Billy Graham is calling Matthews in our day. A lot of people don't share their faith, one, because they don't feel qualified, or two, they don't think it's their calling, it's all of our calling, or three, I just try, but it's difficult for me. I try to go out and share my faith with people. They don't listen, or I don't know what to say. I'm going to tell you what, this uh, My Hope America, this program has made it as easy as it's ever been for any believer to share your faith. Because all you have to do is plan an evening in your home in which you can invite friends and family to come and watch the video. The great part about it is, is that even if you're kind of unsure initially how to present the gospel to people, you don't have to. The whole video presents the gospel through two powerful stories of two different people, as well as Billy Graham himself sharing throughout the video, and then at the end giving them an opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior. All you got to do is follow up with them to find out if they really made a commitment to receive Jesus or not. There is no excuse with this program for any believer to say, I don't know how to win people to the Lord. I promise you, uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to just have us rely on a video to win people to the Lord, but what a great way to start if you're obviously struggling with that to have a chance to invite people into your life. So if you would look again over on the right hand side of the inside of the cover, and I want to go through these five things with you tonight that we briefly touched on this morning about the game plan of what we're going to do to be a part of this My Hope America. But before I do that, let me back up. I almost got ahead of myself. Luke chapter 5. Now, we read Matthew's account this morning of what happened when Matthew became a follower of Jesus Christ. But Luke's account actually gives us a few more details that Matthew's account does not. And I'm going to show you why Billy Graham is stating this as a way for all of us to become Matthews and bring people into the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 5, verse Verse 27. It says, After these things, he, speaking of Jesus, he went out and he saw a tax collector. Everybody say, He saw a tax collector. Now, listen, in their day, they weren't popular people. I know they're not real popular people in our day either, especially what's going on in our government today. But in their day, they were not popular people. These people, they would take advantage of almost everybody that they received taxes from and obviously asked them for more than what was actually due, and they would keep it personally. So they were, very, they were considered obviously some of the uh, meanest people of their day, people that weren't very liked by anybody. So he, Jesus goes out and he saw a tax collector, verse 27, named Levi. Now that was Matthew's original name. Jesus changed it to Matthew. So this is actually referring to Matthew, named Levi, sitting at the tax office. Notice what Jesus said to him. What did he say? Follow me. Everybody say, follow me. Now, we know that none of the believers before Jesus died, was raised from the dead, could actually be born again. But like Abraham, who committed his heart to God, and it was accounted to him to righteousness, 11 of those 12 disciples committed their heart to follow Jesus and to walk with him and obviously receive salvation. The word follow me there literally means to be united with me. You come and you get united with me and become my disciple is what it means. You come and hook up and unite yourself with me and you become my disciple. Let's look what Levi did, Matthew, in his response, verse 28. So he left what? 
He left all, rose up, and he did what? He followed him. He united himself to Jesus and became a student of Jesus Christ, a disciple. I want to learn from you. I want to walk with you. I want to get to know you, know everything about you, and have this experience of new life. So very clearly, verses 27 and 28 are revealing a time frame in which Matthew's responding to Jesus' call to receive eternal life that he would get after he was raised from the dead. Now, sometime after that, sometime after that, as Matthew had been walking with him for a while, verse 29 comes along and it says here, Levi, again, his name changed by Jesus to Matthew. He gave him, Jesus, a great feast. Notice that he gave him a great feast. Where at? In his own house. See, this is what, this is literally what Billy Graham is saying about us all becoming Matthews. Because you and I can throw a party, have some snacks, have some drinks, and invite people to come over and get a chance to meet Jesus in our house. That's what he's talking about. So Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors. Great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes, verse 30, the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? What are you doing sitting in the presence of these sinners? Because you know the Pharisees in their day, they thought to stay holy, you could have nothing to do with sinners. But obviously Jesus came for that very purpose. They thought they were already okay with God. Verse 31, Jesus answered and he said to them, I like this, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are what? Those who are sick. Those who are sick. I like even on this video, uh, something Billy Graham has said for years, there's a sickness in the heart of man and it's called sin. And every human's been infected by it. But how many of you know Jesus Christ is the cure? I said, how many know Jesus is the cure? Yeah. So those who think they're already well, they don't need a physician. It's those who are sick. They're the ones that need the help. Obviously, we know that's all of mankind. Look at verse 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? To repentance. I have come to call the sinners to repentance. I'll tell you, man, in that video this morning, Billy Graham made a powerful statement. The cross... The, the, the cross demands, the cross demands for us to have a change of lifestyle. That's why the cross is offensive to a lot of people. Because what it does is it demands of them to have a complete change of lifestyle. There's another translation of that last verse that says it this way. Jesus in the context saying it from another translation says, I have come to call sinners to change their thoughts and their actions. That's true repentance. I have come to call sinners to change the way they think and the way they act. I have not come to call those who think they're already approved by God. Because obviously the Pharisees thought they were. Truth is, he came for everybody because they're all sinners. But what he's saying is those who already think they're okay with God, I can't help them. But those who obviously know that they're not, I came to do what? I came to call, came to call them to change the way they're thinking and therefore the way they're acting. When you look at the word repentance, the word repentance means to have a change of mind. Therefore, it leads to a change of heart, receiving Christ, and a change of direction, whole new lifestyle. So very clearly, and we saw in Matthew's account this morning, that Jesus quoted Hosea 6.6 6 in this context, and he said, God desires what? Our, des our loyalty is mercy in the, in the English, bad translation. I desire your loyalty, not your sacrifice. I'm not wanting you to think that you, because of what you're doing and how you're living your life, are making some great sacrifice for me. I got a word for you. He made a sacrifice for you. All he wants is your heart now. He wants you to devote that heart to him. Give it to him as a loyalty to him. And I will promise you, you're going to see your life change. Could I get an amen? So, what are we to be about? This whole My Hope America is, to, I am believing for everybody in our church in Granbury and in Roanoke to hook up with this event. Now, you don't have to do it on November 8th. You know, we, we had a lot going on with our revival here and other things God was having us to do. And I'm going to tell you something. This is not a one-time event. We're not getting these DVDs to just do it one time. What's great about this is this is an opportunity where you can contact, contact people, meet people, invite other people that maybe couldn't have come the first time, bring them back into your home, praise the Lord. It'd be great to have a meal, but at least some snacks, some things for them to have, to partake of, drinks, etc., to have some fellowship, show them the video. 
The simplest way to present this to people is simply say, I have a, a video that I'm showing to a bunch of friends of mine that I think you'd enjoy. I'd love for you to come over to my house and be a part of it. We're going to have some snacks and fellowship. Great time. Could you come over on such and such a night at such and such a time and come be a part of it? Just come join us. Have a great time. And if they, incur if they obviously say, yep, you just keep encouraging them until that date. And that night you have the opportunity to actually have a chance to then show them the, the DVD, show them the video and present the gospel to them and obviously do some follow up as well. For all of you that sign up for that DVD, what we're going to do is contact you as well to, or excuse me, have you let us know when your plans are to actually have that event in your home and to let us know how many people you think you're going to actually have show up. And here's why, because as we're going to see in a minute, you're not just want to get going to show them the DVD and get them born again. If they get born again, you're going to want to do some follow up, which we're going to talk about tonight. But let's go through these five points that I love that they've outlined for you to help you to walk through this process. What's the first thing we need to do? We need to look around. We need to look around and identify friends, neighbors, co workers, fellow students, and family members who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. What are you supposed to do? On that column on the right, under my Matthew list, you're to write their names down on that list on the right. Real simple. All you got to do is sit down with your friends that might be born again, your family, your husband, your wife, or just even yourself, and start thinking about, praying about, who do I know that has not made a confession to receive Christ as their Savior? Who do I know that needs to truly receive Christ and be born again? Now, I'm going to tell you something. You even want to watch out thinking that just because somebody told you they're born again, uh, they may not be. What if they're not churched? What if they're not in the house of God? And they're not going to the, to the uh, you know, being a part of and going to the house of God and being involved in the things of God. I would even consider those people as well. I want to show you something to each one of these. Go to John 4 with me if you would. John chapter 4. According to Matthew's story, who is the gospel for? Everybody. Because sickness, the sickness of sin has affected everybody. Now I'm going to tell you again, tax collectors were considered to be some of the worst of the people of their day. And it don't matter how bad somebody thinks they are. It doesn't matter how bad off they think they are. I'll tell you what, the, the gospel's good for everybody. The love of God can change every single heart that will simply receive what Jesus came to offer them. Good news. Everybody say, we know the good news. I like a good friend of mine, I mentioned this morning, Ken Blunt was studying this out. And he said, I've studied this word out very intricately from the original language. The good news is actually defined as good news from the battlefield. What's good news from the battlefield? The war's over. We won. Can you say amen? John chapter 4, I want to show you some verses here that coincide with us looking around for people that we need to put on this list to start reaching out to, to bring to our homes to actually present the gospel. John 4, 34. Now, this is in context to the woman at the well. How many remember Jesus went to that well at Sychar and there was a woman at that well. Do, do you remember anything? Think about this woman for a minute. Do you remember some details? I don't want to go back and read the whole story. You remember some details about this woman? How many husbands had she had? She had five husbands. Did God exclude her from the good news? No, man. And Jesus even addressed that with her. But thank God this was a woman who had godly sorrow. She knew there was a Messiah to come. She knew there was one called by God to be his son, to come to this earth, to deliver her from her sin. And she was waiting for this Messiah. So he had been ministering to her. Think about this. Like Levi, here he had been ministering to her and sharing with her, I'm the Messiah. I am the very Savior that you've been looking for. What did she do? She went back into town and she told all the men of the town, you got to come hear this guy. And could this be the Messiah? He's told me everything about my life. Well, he didn't. He just said, I know you've had five previous husbands and the guy you're living with right now, you're not married to. But the point is, Jesus wasn't pushing her away. He was showing her her need for a Savior. And thank God she had godly sorrow at that moment. And I'm going to teach on that Wednesday night. And she had a desire to repent, to turn to him and receive what he had to offer. So he administered to her. Remember what had happened during that time? His disciples had gone away to get him some food. He said, I'm hungry. He sat at the well. She wasn't there yet. They went on into town, go to Burger King or McDonald's or somewhere, right, to get him something to eat. And they come back. She had gone into town to get all the men of the town. And we pick it up in verse 34. And his disciples now offering him food. 
and he's not hungry. Now all of a sudden he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Think about that statement. My food, the word, the, the whole context of the word food, here, what sustains me, what empowers me, what enables me. It ain't no different for you as a believer. You know what will sustain you in life? You know what will empower you in life? Doing the will of the Father. When you walk out touching other people's lives, I'm going to tell you something. All of a sudden, all the things that you were caught up in in the natural that you thought were so important ain't going to be so important anymore. You're going to find out that what really, honestly makes you somebody who is not only excited about living every day and getting up and looking for opportunity to be used by God, but also sustains you through every single day is doing the will of the Father. So he said, my food is to do the will of him, the Father who sent me, and to finish his work. Now, you know what? He finished that work on the cross. Remember what he said? It is finished. So what needed to be done for all of those who would receive him has already been completed. 35, do you not say, notice what he's telling his disciples, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, underline this please, I say to you what? Lift up your eyes. See, look around, point number one. Lift up your eyes. Come on, church. It is time for us to do what? It's time for us to lift up our eyes. And he says, watch, look, the field, look at the fields. Why? For they are already white for harvest. Now, I have a question. If Jesus, in his day, 2,000 years ago, said, look around, folks. The fields are already white for harvest. Do you not think they still are today? Oh, man, absolutely. I know why a lot of us may think that that may not be true sometimes in our mind. Well, I've shared the gospel with a few people. Uh, they, they've rejected it. They didn't want nothing to do with it. That don't mean there ain't, the fields aren't still white for harvest. That don't mean there aren't people out there that don't want to know Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you what, the whole key to this is don't look up one time. Don't look up and just see four or five friends and that's all I'm ever going to talk to. Uh-uh. Looking up means to get your eyes off of you and start looking around at those around you that need to know Jesus Christ and need this deliverance in their life. Because every sinner does. I'll guarantee you what. Again, they have a sickness that we have a cure for. And as like in the video we saw this morning, there are people out here suffering that are literally going through hell on earth. There's people that constantly think about committing suicide. Their life's a shambles. And I guarantee you what. We know the answer. Jesus Christ. Amen. So he is telling us, you got to get your eyes off of you. It's time to start looking around at these fields that are white for harvest. So point number one, we're to look around and identify Friends, neighbors, co-workers, fellow students, family members. You might frequent a store that you buy groceries at and you might see somebody on a regular occasion. Or you might go in and out of a, a convenience mart where you get gas all the time and see the same person behind the counter. I'm going to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, there's people all around us that are waiting to hear the good news. There's people all around us that are waiting to hear about what Jesus did for them. Now go on here. Verse 36 says, He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows, both he who sows, and he who reaps may do what? What can they do? Rejoice together. Now see, in some cases, you might share the gospel, you might not see the immediate harvest, because you might be the sower at that point. You might be the one planting the first seed or watering the seed that's there. But guess what? If you keep looking up at the fields for the harvest, guess what you're going to do? You're going to also be a part of reaping. You're also going to be a part of seeing souls come into the kingdom. And both get, guess what? Both get rewarded the same for that. It don't matter if you're the one to reap the harvest or just sow the seed. Everybody gets rewarded the same. Verse 37 for in this saying, Jesus said, in this, excuse me, in this, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you. Say, he sent me. Because he's commissioned us all to do this. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have now entered into their labors. I have a word for you. There's people coming across our path every day. I guarantee you. There are people that we are coming across throughout our week, as we go through our week, I promise you that are already ready to receive the good news of Jesus Christ that others have sown into. But if I'm so tunnel vision and focused on my schedule and what I got to do today and all the things I got to do, I'm not looking up. 
I'm not looking for those opportunities. But if I'll start looking for those opportunities, I'll guarantee you what. Do you, do you not think that there's people out there that you know that still need to be born again that ain't ready? I know there are. I know there's people that I obviously are going to come across that are ready. Maybe I don't know them yet, but God can bring them, bring them across my path, bring, bring me across their path. But all you got to do is start looking. All you got to do is start looking. Start looking up and realize that God's going to lead you to those kind of people that are already ripe for harvest. Or at least you're going to be sowing seed and somebody else can obviously enter into that labor and reap that harvest. Amen? The truth is, it ain't you and it ain't me that gets anybody saved. I used to have people tell me all the time, well, you know, Pastor, I just, I, I've tried. I just can't get anybody saved. I said, that's your problem. You're trying to get them saved. Wednesday night, I'm going to show you that really you have nothing to do with getting them saved other than being a vessel God can use to flow through to make that happen. You and I can't convince anybody to get born again. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. And if they have godly sorrow, I promise you, they're going to have a desire to turn. They're going to have a desire to want to come to Jesus. And you'll see that when we talk about that on Wednesday night. So, number one, everybody say, look around. Come on, do it right now. Turn your neighbor and say, you need to start looking around. Praise the Lord. So, what are we looking for? I want you this week. I want you this week to take this and keep it in your Bible. Ask God every day to show you people around you, in your neighborhood, in, where you live, in your family, amongst your friends, wherever you work or wherever you may go. God, I know there's people that you want me to reach out to. And even if I bring him in my home and I do the presentation of the gospel and they don't immediately receive salvation right then, guess what I did? We planted a seed or we watered a seed. It doesn't mean I didn't do what I was supposed to do. That's a part of what Christians also miss about obviously witnessing to people is they think, if I don't see the harvest, I failed. No, you didn't. If you shared the gospel, if you got that presentation to them, you accomplished exactly what God wanted to do. Do you know that it's a proven fact and if you think about your own salvation, I know for me it was more than this. But it's a proven fact that the average person has to have the gospel presented to them, they say, an average of seven times before they'll respond to it. I promise you, for me, it was more than that. I know that for a fact. And I'm, I'm going to guarantee you, that's just because people are, those seeds kept getting planted. Those seeds kept getting watered. As time went on, I'd hear it again. It'd make me think about it a little more. Then I'd hear it again, all of a sudden make me think a little different. Well, maybe I better consider, maybe I'll start thinking about this. So I'm telling you, the number one thing that you and I got to start doing is looking around and writing these names down. So right here on the right-hand side, what are you going to do? Go write those names down. What's the second thing we're to do? Tell me. What's to say right there on your, on your deal, on your sheet? Which is praying. What's number two, though? All these start with a look. Look around. Number two, look up. So you get your prayer list created. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Say glory to God. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Praise the Lord. My peanut gallery up there is pretty quiet tonight. Usually I get a few amens out of them up there. Everybody say look up. Look up. So what you and I want to do is look around. What you need to do, I encourage you actually to just kind of jump ahead, but we're about to get to that. You need to start thinking about planning, say, oh, maybe 20, 30 days out, a couple, two, three weeks out, a time that you want to set up a time in your home to show this video presentation. And I guarantee you, even if you don't think you have enough room in your home, it'd be worth it to pack them in there somehow or get with one of, one of the other people in the church and combine your efforts, which is a good idea as well, and you can do it together. You don't have to just do it by yourself. You can hook up with somebody else in the church. So we need to look up, number two on your outline there, look up and pray what? Every day for each person that you've listed. Prayer is vital. Prayer is absolutely vital. Because prayer, the Bible says, when done so effectively by one who knows their right standing with God, from out of their heart avails much. And I'm telling you something, prayer is a foundation we need to lay to obviously have something going on working in these people's lives before we get them in our home to present them the gospel. See, at this point, have you invited anybody to your house? No. Nope. All you've done so far is looked around and come up with a list of people you want to invite. Now, before you talk to them, everybody say before you talk to them. Before you invite them yet, what you need to start doing is praying for them every day and believe in God to do what Ephesians chapter 1 says right here. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have this as, as a part of your notes about how to pray for people for salvation, I know a lot of people 
for a lot of years have prayed for people say, oh, God, get them saved. Lord, you ever said that? Lord, get them saved. Lord, get them born again. Man, do whatever you got to do to get them born again. But you know what? That ain't in the Bible. So that's why a lot of times our prayers haven't been very effective. Let me refer to a verse, and then I'm going to look at these Ephesians verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan is the God of this world. He has blinded the minds of people to this gospel. But I have a question. Who has authority over this rascal? Every believer does. So what you need to recognize in your prayer time is you need to deal with this very rascal who has blinded their mind to the gospel, Satan. So first and foremost, before we even read these Ephesians uh, verses here, when you start praying for these people every day, here's what you need to speak over them every day. Now, you don't have to say this over them directly. You, you say this to the work of darkness. You say, Satan, I bind you today and every demon of yours from off of this person's life. You will not be able to blind them to the gospel. I call you bound from doing so in the name of Jesus. Why every day? Demons could come back every day. Demons can re return to them every day. But you take authority over those demons and bind those demons and command them to be removed from their presence that they will not be able to blind them to the gospel. Now, I learned this Ephesians 1 prayer by Brother Kenneth Hagin. He had talked about a, a brother that he had that wasn't born again. He had been praying for him for years. I think like two years. And like I'm saying, you know, pray, oh God, save him. Oh God, you got to change his life. Oh God, he needs salvation. And the Lord spoke to him one day and said, you're not praying at all in line with my word. He said, that's not going to help him at all. Well, how could I pray for him? So he led him right here to Ephesians chapter 1. We call it the Ephesians 1 prayer. It's not only good for sinners, it's good for believers that are walking in darkness as well. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15, if you'll pick it up with me here. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, talking to the church at Ephesus, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, notice this, do not cease to give thanks for you. Well, he's praying for believers. Yeah, he is. But look at the prayer. Look at the prayer. Because this is what the Lord showed Brother Hagin to pray for his lost brother. Watch this. I do not cease to give thanks for you. I do not cease to do what? Give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may do what? may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'm going to tell you what, that's a powerful thing to pray over a non-believer. Lord, I'm asking you to help this person that when they hear the gospel, they by the spirit of God are going to get revelation of you. That's what he just said. They by the spirit of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, they are going to come to know you. They are, come to gonna, they are gonna come to receive knowledge of you. That's to know him. Look at verse 18. That the eyes, he goes on with this prayer, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what? The hope of God's calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance that comes into every saint that's born again, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he, God, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, where? Far above, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And what else? Every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So let me just summarize four things that Paul talked about here in this prayer. And this was a prayer for the believers in Ephesus, but this is a prayer for anybody anywhere and great to pray for those who don't know God personally. He began to pray this every day, every day for his brother. As he began to pray this for his brother, he said, it wasn't but just a few weeks. I got a call from my brother. And guess what his brother said? Kenneth, I'm seeing stuff about God I've never seen before. I'm beginning to understand the Bible, and I never could understand the Bible before. And as a matter of fact, I want you to know, because God's opened my eyes up to these truths, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I'm born again. Say, the word works. Say it a little louder, please. Say it with authority. The word works. Pray in line with the word for these people. Number one, verse 17, we are asking God that by the Holy Spirit, he is going to make himself known to them. 
He is going to reveal himself to them by the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that's going to draw them. The Bible says no one comes to the Father lest the Father draws them. How does he do that? He's in heaven. He does it by the work of the Holy Spirit. Number two, we're going to ask you, Father, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, opened up. The eyes of their understanding in their physical eyes, it's their spiritual eyes. Help their heart be open and receptive to know the hope of your calling, what you have a desire for their life. In this case, they're not a believer, so what's that desire for their life? To get born again. That they would come to know the call of God for them to be born again. Lord, let the eyes of their understanding be open to that. Especially when they come to my house on that night, in Jesus' name, they're going to have their eyes open to see what you desire for their life. Three is also found in that verse. It says also that they may know of the glory of his inheritance that's in the saints. So not only do I want their eyes open to know what you have as a calling for their life to be born again, but that they could then see how to receive what you have for them as the inheritance as a child of God, which is what? In their case, it's salvation. That they could see how simple this is. That they could understand what Jesus did for them. And therefore, they could receive this obvious inheritance he desires for all of us to be what? Born again. Verse 19, you can go on to pray and that you are also, Lord, going to help them to have understanding of the power of God that's available to them that can change their life as a new believer in Christ. In Jesus' name. So you start praying these things every day over those people on your list. And especially on the night of the presentation, you make sure and pray that before anybody gets to your home. In Jesus' name. And bind every demon from hindering anybody from seeing the truth of the gospel. Amen? Everybody say, look up. So we're to look up and start praying for these people on our list every single day. Go to 2 Corinthians with me. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now these are some verses that I'm going to get into in detail along with some others on Wednesday night. I'm just going to kind of barely touch on them a little bit tonight because I wanted to finish this overview with you that they have so well laid out for us. Uh, these five steps, look around, start looking around. The, the fields are white for harvest. Start looking at those that you want, uh, that you know God wants you to start putting on your list here to invite into your home to actually be a Matthew and have the presentation of the gospel through this great video that they've provided. Number two, then you're going to start praying for them. You haven't talked to them yet. You're going to start praying for them according to Ephesians 1 and 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Number three, start looking for opportunities to build relationship with these people. All right, now we're going to start reaching out to them. Now we're going to start reaching out to them. Don't wait until the day before your event. I'm talking about after you've laid several days of prayer down for them and keep praying for them every day, you start believing for the Holy Spirit. Listen carefully. You start believing for the Holy Spirit to show you opportunity of how you can build relationship with this person. It don't mean you have to become best of friends. We're talking about how you can obviously get an a a opportunity, a chance, and, uh, the, the door open to be able to speak into their life and invite them to come to your home to actually view this video. Now, I want to show you this as to the compelling force as to what we need to keep thinking about as we're reaching out to build relationship with these people. 2 Corinthians 5.14, I referred to it this morning. Watch this. Paul said, for the love of Christ, everybody say the love of Christ. For the love of Christ does what? It compels. It compels us. It, it's the very compulsion that's pushing us forward to do what we're called to do. The love of Christ compels us, watch this, because we judge thus, or we now understand this, that if one person died, speaking of Jesus for all, then what does that reveal? All are dead. Obviously now... The other side of the cross, they understand this truth. Uh, before when he was talking about dying, we didn't understand it. We didn't know what the heck he was talking about. What do you mean you're going to die? Well, what are you going to die for, man? We need a new king here in, in uh, Jerusalem. Thought you're going to sit on the rulership over Jerusalem, sit on the throne here over Jerusalem. But now they understood. All right, we get it. We totally get it. If this one man died for everybody, we understand that everybody's dead. What's the key to this verse? We understand why he died for us. Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Why did he die for me and you? Why did he die for this whole world? God so loved the world. Right? The proof of God's love is the cross. 
Because the truth about the cross is, the cross was, without a doubt, the most gruesome, the most painful uh, punishment anybody could ever go through uh, as a, in, the, in the context done by the Romans as a citizen of Rome and or one in that area in which they lived. For them to crucify you on the cross was the harshest form of punishment for anybody in society. The cross, and I don't think it's wrong for us to have a cross on a necklace or to have crosses, you know, but the cross today in representation in their day was not an ornament that they would wear as a type of jewelry. It represented nothing pretty to them. It represented everything ugly to them. And I'm going to tell you something. When you think about it, Jesus did not sin. Jesus became sin. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Because what he's trying to tell you is he's trying to show you how much they now see the revelation of how God loves them because of what Jesus did on that cross. Because one died for everybody, we know everybody died. And we recognize the love that God showed us through that cross when Jesus went to that cross. And that's the love in our heart that now compels us to reach out to those that are still dead spiritually and need to know God personally. How was that love revealed? They understood that on that cross, what did Jesus become? He became an adulterer. He became a fornicator. He became a uh, murderer. He became a child molester. You understand? He became an alcoholic. He became a drug addict. He became a prostitute. I'm telling you what the Bible says. He did not sin he became sin for us. On that cross, he became all of what we were as sinners. Now, if that ain't the proof that God loves you, I don't know what is. That God, in his mercy, his love, and his grace towards us, said, even though you don't deserve to receive this new life, I'm not giving it to you because you deserve it. I'm giving it to you. Why? Tell me why. Because I love you. Because I love you. I don't want to see you perish. And I made this statement this morning. I want to make it again. Every human on the planet, every human on this planet has life eternal. Life eternal. We'll live eternally is another way to say it. Every human on this, on this planet, you won't live here. Every human will live eternally somewhere. But not every human has eternal life. You'll live eternally. That don't mean you have eternal life. What, do you know what Jesus defined eternal life as in John 17? See, most believers still today, they think of eternal life as eternity with God, included. But that's not actually what eternal life is defined as in the Bible. In John 17, is verse 2 or 3 right there, Jesus said, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, that they may know you. Because it's all about restoration of relationship with the Father. These disciples knew. I'll guarantee you what. Without a doubt, man, it was burning deep into their soul because they're the ones that saw him crucified. They're the ones that saw him go through what he went through when he was scourged. They're the ones that saw him go through what he went through when he was hung on that cross. And they knew he has taken upon himself all of our sin. Every single thing that we had ever done that was sinful, Jesus Christ of Nazareth became on the cross. If that, again, is not proof of God's love, I don't know what is. The reason I believe that a lot of times we as believers are not motivated to get out and witness and do what Jesus Christ called us to do. We do not have, we're not walking in the light of revelation of how much God loves us. Because that's the love that compelled them to do what they did. And these are the guys that were stoned and left for dead, Paul. These were the guys that were taken before magistrates and beaten with rods and, and scourged. And I mean treated horribly. And you know what? It didn't stop them from preaching the gospel. Anybody know why? Love of Christ. That love compelled them. That love empowered them to keep going forth and sharing the gospel. So again, in verse uh, uh, 14, they knew if one died for all, then guess what? All are dead. Verse 15, he, Jesus, died for all. Aren't you glad? I said, aren't you glad? Come on, let me hear all those amens from Roanoke tonight. He died for all that those who live. Who are those who live? Those who receive this new life. So that'd be me. So now he's talking about us. He died for all that those who live, you ought to underline this statement, should live no longer for themselves. We should live no longer for ourselves. Peanut gallery. 
We should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Now, if we're living for he who died for us and rose again, you know what we're going to do? John 4. Look up. Look up. Quit being so focused on your little schedule and your little timetable and all your affairs of life and all these things that you think are so vital and so important and you just got to get all this stuff done. And all I got to, oh, now listen, and Jesus is saying, do what? Would you look up? Would you let my love compel your heart to begin to see what I'm seeing and to look up and see this harvest? Because I'm going to tell you what, child of God, if you go begin to do the work of Jesus Christ, and see people's lives changed and saved, I guarantee you what, you are going to be one totally joyous, happy uh, man or woman of God. There is no greater feeling in this life than seeing people's lives changed through what God can do through a believer. God's the one that does it. We're the vessel He uses to do it. And it's time. Say it's time. Look at America. Uh, I'm telling you, why do you think God moved on Billy Graham's heart to take, do you, do you have any idea? We're going to receive a special offering next Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night here for this. Do you have any idea what this is costing their ministry to give all these materials free? All these DVDs, all the, all the paper materials, all the books, and all the videos they produce and everything that are absolutely free to be used? I guarantee you why. Because Billy Graham realizes as one who has been called by God to share the gospel, and now that I've obviously been in a position where I can't travel and preach like I used to, I am seeing a moral condition in America that is not good. And I want to do everything I can before I go to heaven to reach people with the gospel, the good news, because of how much God loves us, because of how much God cares about us. Amen? So my encouragement to you is if you aren't taking time to look up, you really need to start thinking back to the day that you were born again and allow that very feeling of what you experienced with God that day to begin to overwhelm you once again. And that love that touched your heart. And now let that love compel you to go share that with somebody else. So at this point, number three, look out for opportunities. What you're asking the Holy Spirit to do, Holy Spirit, by the love that's in my heart for my, my Savior, my God, my Jesus, and the love He has for me, you begin to present to me opportunity to build relationship with these people. Because some of these people that you should put on your list probably may not be people you know real well. Probably may not be people that you're real close with or that you associate with a lot. And you know what Jesus did continually? He showed the people he cared about them. He reached out to them to show that he cared about them. Guys, listen, that could be as simple as inviting somebody to have a cup of coffee at Starbucks, sit down, and don't talk about you, talk about them. Ask them about their family. Ask them about their kids. Ask them about what they're doing in their life, etc. You might not even get them to your house. You might get an opportunity to present the gospel right there. But I'm just telling you, when you show people that you care about them, I guarantee you what, it makes all the difference in the world in reaching out to them. Because that's what Jesus did. Say it. I'm going to believe. I want to make sure you get this. Say it. I'm going to believe. Say it again. I'm going to believe. Lift a hand to heaven and say, Lord, I am believing for the Holy Spirit. To help me to look out to those that you want me to reach and build relationship with them in Jesus' name. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will help you do it. I'll guarantee you it will help you do it because God wants to touch people's lives. What's the fourth step? Now look forward. Look forward to the event. You got to start making some plans. You got to start setting up a time. You got to start setting up a day to do this. Start planning what you're going to have there for snacks. This again is where both you and Granberry and you and Roanoke, some of you would benefit to actually combine your efforts together. Get a couple of you together. Talk about whose home you're going to do it in. Plan a time. Plan a day. Plan what you're going to bring for snacks or drinks or whatever to prepare that night to obviously be able to reach forward to what God wants us to do in presenting the gospel. So begin to look forward to that event. Begin to think about the preparations for that event. Begin to think about now inviting those people to make sure they understand about that event. And here's why you don't need to wait till the last couple days before. Because how many know a lot of times when you invite somebody to something like this in your home, how many know you're probably going to get a lot of these answers? Well, I'm not sure if I can. Let me get back with you. I have a word for you. Don't wait for them to get back with you. Invite them, give them a few days, because you're looking ahead. Invite them, give them a few days, call them back up. 
Go see him again. Say, hey, just wanted to remind you, having a great little fellowship in my home. I, I would, you're not being deceptive at all. I wouldn't say, oh, a bunch of us Christians are going to get together. We're going to present the gospel to you and see if we can get you saved. You know what? All you got to do is just say, we got a great video that we want to show everybody. It's a great blessing. I, I believe it'll help you. It'll be a great blessing to your life. Bring some hope to your life. Bring some help into your life. And we're going to have some great fellowship. We're going to have some good fellowship around some great food and some snacks and stuff. You can even tell them if you want. Hey, if you want to bring something, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. We're just going to come together, have a good time together. Praise God. If you have not gotten on that website yet, they have training to tell you step by step how to do this. And to show you examples of people doing it, the uh, My Hope with BillyGraham.org, it's on the back of this sheet. They got all kinds of free training for you that you can go through by just signing up and checking out their videos. Everybody say, look forward. So, in looking forward, what are we doing now? We're planning the event. We're setting the day. We're getting our, all of our ducks in a row and making sure we got the food we need and everybody's going to come. And we start getting the invites out. We start talking to people. We start inviting them to come. Now, as you're going to invite them to come, before you knock on that door, before you pick up that phone, you've been praying for them every day. But before you actually present that invitation, what should you do in looking forward? Pray. Pray. A little simple prayer. Lord, thank you for helping this person's heart to be open and receptive, to receive my invitation to come and hear the gospel in the name of Jesus. And give me the words to speak. You reach through me and you touch their life and you help me to invite them to this event in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, you have the event in your home. You bring them in. You show them the DVD. If you show them the one that we showed this morning called The Cross... It's the only of the three that I've seen that they actually have clips of Franklin Graham coming in and talking, uh, through, or excuse me, sorry, Billy uh, Graham talking throughout the event. Franklin does at the start and the end, but I'm talking about Billy Graham's actually on there as well, talking about the cross, what it means, etc. Great opportunity for you to let Billy Graham, a very anointed evangelist, I, you, don't, you don't think for a moment he did this by happenstance. He prayed, man, he believed God for what to speak. So I'm telling you, all you got to do is show that video. 28, 29 minutes in length. When it's done, he gives them an opportunity to pray right there to receive salvation at the end of that, of that video. What I would do at the end of that is if you heard nobody pray, here's what I would encourage you to do. If you got any fe uh, fellow believers in the home with you, when he goes into that prayer, you all should just begin to pray it out loud with him. But here's what you do when you're done. All you have to do now, finally, but last not least, do what? Number five. Do what? Look after them. How do you do that? You want to follow up by finding out now, has anybody here tonight prayed that prayer for the first time and received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Never done it before. If anybody's hands go up, immediately you're going to want to make sure and talk to them before they leave. All right? And you can take a moment to thank everybody for coming. Let's enjoy some fellowship together. I would have a time of fellowship afterwards so you can go meet with these people. And it gives you an opportunity as well in case anybody didn't pray that prayer, but now they want to. Now they want to receive Christ as their Savior. And I'm going to share with you Wednesday night how to do that. But here's something vitally important to all the aspects of what the Bible tells us about what we're called to do as believers. Go to Matthew 28. I'm going to close there tonight. Matthew 28. To look after these people is to actually now follow up, to be able to follow up so that we can help them to grow in their faith and continue their relationship, not only with the Lord, but with fellow believers. Get them in your church. Get them coming to the house of God. Get some time spent with other believers, etc. Because it's what we are all called to do as the body of Christ. We aren't called. There's not, a, there's not a verse in all the Bible that Jesus said, go and get people born again. How I many you know he did not say that? He talked about being born again. Praise the Lord uh, to a gentleman, Nicodemus, who came and asked him about salvation. But Jesus never commissioned any of the church to specifically just to go get people born again. You know why? He wants them to be devoted Christ followers. To be a disciple, you got to get born again. first step. So obviously that's a given. Matthew 28, come on, our great commission. I know you know it, but this is why we want to continue to follow up with these people because of what Jesus said here. Jesus came and spoke to his disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, circle it, highlight it, circle it, highlight it, put, put, put little uh, parentheses around something. Go, everybody say go. Watch this. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples. 
make disciples of all the nations, all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Watch this, verse 20, teaching them. Underline it, teaching them. Teaching them what? To observe all the things that he has commanded us. And lo, I am with you. Who's going to help you do this? Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now listen, I said it this morning. I'm going to say it again. If everybody in the body of Christ is waiting for the pastor to disciple everybody, this is why we're not fulfilling the Great Commission. I love my pastor, my pastor Dr. Barclay's definition of what it takes to make a disciple because it's borne out by the Bible. How do you make a disciple? The expenditure of much time. The expenditure of much time. Now think about the reward, though, of being able to disciple somebody as a child of God, raise them up in the things of God, and see them walk victorious in this earth. Because if you make a disciple out of them, you know what you taught them to do? You taught them to do what you just did. You not only help them to know how to walk out what God wants for their life, you are teaching them to go do the same thing, to become a Matthew, get a video, invite people to your home, and duplicate that same effect. It's time. It's time for the body of Christ in America to rise up and to do what God commissioned us to do. So to make a disciple out of them, we're going to help you. And I'll tell you what, Billy Graham has made it so simple because for all of you that sign up on that sign-up sheet and then you give us the date of your event when we contact you and you tell us, I've got five people, I've got 10, I've got 15 coming over. What we're going to do is we're going to give you, we pre-ordered books from Billy Graham's association called Life in Christ. Life in Christ. It is a great little mini book that you can pre-read yourself and after that night, after you get them born again, you can hand every single one of them one of those Life in Christ books. I wouldn't just hand them the book, though. Guess what the book's designed to do? It's real simple. The book is designed for you now for a short period of, a, of several weeks to set up a little meeting once a week or once every other week in your home to bring them back in and give them the basics of what they need to start doing to walk in their faith out with Christ. It's powerful. This is not only, listen to me carefully, I'm going to tell you why a lot of believers are not fully maturing to the degree that they could as a believer. I'm going to guarantee you what, man. Uh, Melanie's a teacher. She can tell you this, and any of you have ever taught anything at all, I'll guarantee you, you'll attest to this as well. I know this because I'm a teacher of the Word. You are going to grow by leaps and bounds as a believer when you start teaching other people the Word of God. If all we do is just sit and receive teaching all the time, that's good to help us to understand what we need to know. But you really want to walk out what, you, what that Bible teaches? Start teaching other people what the Word of God says. You'll come into revelation you never had from the Word of God before. When you start teaching the Word, who is it that's with you doing this? Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. Remember what he said? I am with you even to the end of the age. You're not going to be alone. I'm going to help you do this. You don't have to be some quote-unquote Bible theologian to take a little mini book and to simply pre-read each week and have a time that you sit down and you go over that with them because this book helps them understand now that they're born again, where do they go from here? What's the next steps? And that's vital to follow up. Because I promise you, I like Brother Hagin's analogy, you don't go to the hospital, birth a baby, go home, and just let that baby figure out a way to get home. No, man. You got to bring them home, and you got to train them up, and you got to raise them up, so obviously they can be an adult, and then begin to do the same thing on their own. Could I get an amen? So it is with the body of Christ. We're not just to get people born again. What's our goal? Make disciples out of them. And I'm going to guarantee you what? If you truly love being a part of a Bible-based, Spirit-filled, Word of Faith church, both here in Granbury and in Roanoke, I guarantee you, as baby Christians, there's going to be some things that's going to happen in our services that they're not going to understand. I was the same way. There's going to be some things that they're going to be a little uncomfortable with at first. You know why? Because the things of the Spirit are not things that are comfortable to the flesh. And they're going to have to develop and grow just like you to understand those things. And that's where you come in. Because even as you start bringing them to church and you start contacting them on a regular basis, if they have questions, well, why did this happen? Well, hey, pastor laid hands on that person. They fell down. What do you do? Beat them on the head, knock them down or something? What's the deal there? What's going on? I've never seen that happen before. What's this, what's this funny language y'all are praying in, etc.? So you could be the one to help them understand how to know what Scripture teaches about all that God has for them and help them develop as a believer in Christ. I'm telling you, there is no greater rewarding feeling in your life than being able to be a part of God using you to change the life of somebody else. Amen.
This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624.